be minded because their picks might not be suitable for you. They might be too high risk. There might not be enough risk. Uh, so we're going to learn how actually you should pick your own stocks and be more independently minded, even though you might read, and I'm going to share, as I said, these stock names, what's in mine, what's in my son's junior ISA, what the big banks are saying, what the hedge funds are saying. But aside from that, I'm still going to share with you how you pick your own, suitable to your risk level. So make it uh, uh, educational for you. And one of the most important parts of that is the way I want you to think about investing. When you're investing, you need a large gene pool of companies to examine. Otherwise, just like when you're hiring somebody for a job, if you only have a very few uh, CVs in front of you, then you're picking from a narrow gene pool, you're not gonna get the best talent. Okay, so we're gonna look at the universe of 10,000 equities and the people that we give the money to, in other words, whoever's shares we're buying, the people we're giving the capital to, they are custodians for our pension or our children's inheritance. That's the way to look at it. So I want to go down from 10,000 stocks as quickly as possible because there's roses to be smelt and, and you know walks to be had and time with family to be spent. I want to go down from 10,000 to the top 1%. Because, of course, if somebody's going to manage your capital, they should be in the top percent, shouldn't they? And that's how... I look at it and that's the attitude I'm going to teach you and the process I'm going to teach you to copy as well. Okay, so that's that's the basic format we're going to use for all of that. And make sure you're ready. One of the most important things you can do is get a camera phone because there's going to be slides with a lot of information and you're going to want to take photos. Not necessarily this one, photogenic though I might look there, but other ones where I'm going to be showing you a heck of a lot of data and yeah, you'll want to take those images. I mean, what if I showed you this much data? You're not going to be able to, I'm going to read through all of that on a, on a uh, webinar. You're going to have to take a shot and then I'll explain it and you're going to have to uh, come back to it a little bit later, okay? So that's why I wanted to sh say that it's not just about um, uh, uh, just what you see and write. So photos you'll want to do and you'll also want a notepad. Anybody who wants to gamble and thinks we're here to sort of speculate and say, whoa, Bitcoin, buy it tomorrow, it's gonna to go to the moon, or you're trying to double your money in a super short space of time, this, this webinar is not for you. Uh, this is for people who are, whether in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, with SIPs, ISAs, looking to hold, I invest, invest 12 months, then the next 12 months, then the next 12 months. So we're not looking for, we're not, this is not a trading webinar and it's not a buy and hold forever as if you could forecast what's going to happen in the world uh, over a forever period of time in any event. Okay. So that should help. Right. Other quick things you need to know uh, on those uh, issues. The other quick things you need to know, you should be able to see all of that very clearly is uh, close the doors, keep it quiet, please. Notebook pad, paper, all the rest of it, okay? Um, well, these are the solutions and these are the problems. These are the problems and solutions we're gonna be looking at in this webinar, okay? Uh, where are we in the markets? Where are we right now? I'll do that relatively quickly. What are the big hedge funds investing? What are the big banks saying? Like I showed you some of the Goldman Sachs picks. What's my portfolio? Why is yours probably lagging? What's likely to go out? What's suitable for your risk reward profile, okay? Those are the things that we're going to be focused on in this. Make sure you follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I can't connect with you unless you're a client, and there's a couple of reasons for that. But follow me. There's a difference between following and connection, and you will be able to on LinkedIn. If you follow me, you'll see some articles uh, that I post regularly on there. Uh, and you'll see a whole bunch of things. Uh, they're all free sort of videos and, and quite a lot of research stuff. You'll also get a bit more background about me uh, as well as uh, what I do on the asset management side, what I do with government. Okay, so feel free to follow because you'll get lots of great information there as well. So I'm saying that right up. Um, don't try and connect unless you're a client, I'm afraid, because I won't be able to accept your connection as things stand at the moment for a variety of reasons. Now, Risk reward, these are some of the other things people want to know. They want to know about the double leverage side, which is higher risk, you know, getting uh, bigger returns all the way down to lower risk and safe. And we're going to cover all of that in this. Okay, we're going to cover all of that in this. Uh, 
Important piece of information. This is not specific investment advice to any one of you. Because, uh, and by the way, put in the uh, put in the chat box where you're from. But you know, look, Martin, Anise, Andrew, Rakesh, Damien, James. I don't know you personally, Harish, Huey, uh, Ravi. Well, Ravi, I do know personally. Uh, Alfredo, James, Ross. I don't know you personally, so it can't be individual personal advice um, uh, as well. All right. So that's essentially what that says over there. As I always say on my webinars, I want to make sure you've got lots and lots of added value. So I'm going to give you actually not one, but three free gifts. And you don't even have to watch to the end. I'm going to do it midway through. So you're going to get those free gifts uh, as you go through this. Because I want people to leave my webinars saying, wow, this is fantastic. Hey, Chip from Leeds. It's been ages. Uh, I hope, uh, hope you're well. Matthew from South Africa. Fantastic. Delighted. Uh, we've got we usually get about 20% outside of the UK on this from you know the US. It's a bit early in the US, uh, all the way up to Australia and Singapore. So great to have somebody from uh, uh, there. Surrey, Wakefield. I know Wakefield well. Tox, Bradford. I know Bradford. I used to live there for a short while. Born in Leeds. Wakefield, I know very well um, as well because I'm a Yorkshireman. Right. This is what the markets are. So let's just start off with where we are on the markets. Just a quick overview. Okay. This is the S&P 500 over the last six months. Right. Now, it seems from today's headlines that we're likely to now go through that regular phase where the market's bottomed out and we're going to resume upwards. Well, we'll see. Okay. So we've had some of our profits taken off as well. How do we deal with that? Where are the opportunities now? Are they with these big companies? Are they with small caps? Are they just with US stocks? What about UK ones? What about global ones? We're going to go through all of that in this webinar. And what if like on a Danaher, which is up 32% or a Costco up 24%, how do you protect some of those gains you've already got? That's a question you'll have. Should we be looking at specific sectors? Should we look top down and say, well, we want to be in software, we want to be in consumer electronics? Or should we be looking bottom up saying, I don't care what sector we're in, as long as they're making me money, because you can see lots of greens in, you know, everything from banks all the way to basic material. So what do you care what sector it's in? So we're going to answer all of those questions, going to keep, give you a simple process by which you can do it. Swansea, fantastic. I went to school in Cardiff for a short while. Uh, Shepparton uh, and North London, fantastic, fantastic. So this is the global markets. Now, I said I want us to pick from a gene pool of 10,000 equities. Why? Because we want 10,000 CVs uh, in front of us, and each company is a CV for managing our capital. Okay, so over the last six months, every single one of these companies you see here is listed on uh, the U.S. exchanges. Okay, even the British companies, they've got a listing on the U.S. exchanges. So where do we get our 10,000 companies from? Well, they're these, plus all the American companies, plus all the British companies. So we're going to look at London Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange. They're going to be our two main places, and NASDAQ, okay? They're going to be our three main places. And you, and that gives us access to Chinese companies, Japanese, Taiwanese, you know, I mean, for God's sake, Singaporean, Australian, South African. We've got a lot to choose from. Now, you might say, no, 10,000 is not enough for me, Alpesh. I really want to know, you know, which companies are out of Cambodia. Seriously, come on, Okay. So we're going to ask the, answer the question, how many stocks should we own for how long, right? I'm going to give you those numbers. And how do we protect the gains when we make them? And what should we look for those stocks so that we have gains to begin with? Now, as you all settle down, Yorkshire and Dan, fantastic in London, me as well. Uh, this was in, and I've mentioned this before, but I've got to flex this. So as you get your water, you get your notepad and your cell phone for the photo shots. Um, Warren Buffett, make way for the Finfluencers. Investors Chronicle did me a great uh, service doing this. So if you're not following me on TikTok, you might want to, because um, it's now over 50,000 followers, by the way, on there. So you might want to have a look. And Investors Chronicle picked up on it. So I'm, I'm pleased with that. OK, TikTok's a world away from when, you know, you're staring at Bloomberg terminals. When I used to do my show on Bloomberg on Tuesdays and Wednesday nights, if those of you remember from there. So I'm giving you my experience over 20 years, both as a fund manager, but I'm also going to take the expertise from Goldman Sachs, UBS, all those, and what they're saying right now. So it's not just about me and my analysis. It's also analysis that's come from the big banks. And I'm going to share with you the analysis from academia, because I think that's relevant as well. Again, in terms of where we are, I started this whole journey of focusing purely 100% of my time on investing back in 1999. I used to, when I was a barrister, to do it part-time, but then I left the bar, focused full-time. At that time, the FTSE was pretty much at the levels it is today. 
Okay, and I'm going to show you the column I wrote in the Financial Times to say I'm shifting towards more US stocks. That was in 1999. And this is what's happened since. If I just track the index, I'm pleased to say I did a bit better than tracking the index. You'd expect that. But even if I just track the index, my pension would be up threefold compared to somebody who's in Britain who might be using just a British IFA uh, uh, or a British fund manager focused on the British markets will probably have tracked the UK indices and their pension's gone nowhere. So for a start, without any ingenuity, we were able to get triple the returns. And actually, we don't want triple the returns over 20 years. We want to try and get more returns over a shorter period of time. But that's where we are at the moment. And I'll share with you the, the article that I'd written back in 1999, which the Financial Times published, um, just so you've got the credentials and it's not just where's this guy come from. Uh, and that's when I wrote my first column there was 99. So you need to know, OK, what's the What's the background of the guy? This is where we are more recently, year to date. Where are we on the S&P, the NASDAQ, the Dow, and the and the Russell 2000, which includes a lot more of the smaller cap stocks? Okay, because I want to give you some breakdown by capitalization and where we are. You know, It's important to know. It might feel like over the last couple of weeks that we're negative for the year. Well, actually not. And those aren't bad returns. Even if you went to bed now and said, forget it, rest of the year I'm just taking off, that's okay. My target for my global picks is 40% per annum. I don't get that every year. Okay, some years I get more, some years I get less. Uh, for just UK stocks, if you put a gun to my head and said, just give me UK stocks, then it's 20% because the UK grows less. So it's half that number, as you saw earlier on from the FTSE 100 chart. So how are we gonna try and target a 40% return? Again, some years you get more, some years you get less. Well, we're gonna try and, we've, our, our tailwind is just the index alone. That's gonna give it to us. And then we wanna try and beat that through some cherry picking, all right? Uh, and some data for you over here. Take a picture of this, I'm not gonna go through it. This is where I said, I really want you to start taking photos of things. Okay, so this is one of those where I'd like you to take a photo, please, uh, the S&P. Um, nothing to really add, okay, nothing to really add, but uh, that's what uh, I want you to look at. Now, some recent headlines, uh, and we're going to go through some of this. So where are we? Are we about to have a mighty crash, or are we going to continue going up, and how are we going to pick those stocks anyway? You need to be in charge. You should not be picking off headlines. You should not be picking off journalists. You should not be picking purely off uh, looking at um, uh, just commentators and saying, oh, well, he had it, so I'll have it, because that's going to give you a hodgepodge of a portfolio, which is going to end up with about 60 stocks in it. I've got a call later today with somebody who's got about 60 stocks in their portfolio, and I'm going to show you mathematically why that's not going to uh, benefit you, because you'll have diversified all the stock-specific risk, and all you're left with is a market tracker, in which case, just buy an index tracker. It's a lot bloody cheaper. Okay, so where are we in all of this? And my job is to educate you so you're empowered to know, right, these are the five things I should be looking for, or eight things I should be looking for. This is where I get the information. Oh, very nice, Warren Buffett's got that. Very nice, Bill Gates owns that. Very nice, George Soros owns that. Goldman Sachs says this. But I know what's in my criteria. Oh, they do agree with me. That's good. It's not you agree with them, it's that they have to agree with you. That's the level of information you should have. And these are the estimates I'm gonna take. I showed you earlier on the uh, Goldman's one. Um, I put on my um, my uh, Telegram channel, in case you missed it, I put this on earlier and said, we're gonna go. So what I've done is I've taken BlackRock, Schroders, For Forrester, UBS, Russell, Goldman, Citibank, all of these different ones and a few more, okay? And I've put them together. And we've got a table of well, what do they what do they um, agree on, and what what levels? Okay, so let's share some of that. This is not to say oh we're going to go out and buy it. It's just to give you a flavour of the market, and then I'm going to show you what do I own based on. Actually, I want to tick more boxes than even they do. All right. So uh, and it gives us a process. So first of all, we're still discussing what does the market look like. These are some of their names. Okay, so it's not as if the analysts are saying the market's finished. These are their names. That they put up doesn't mean I'm going to buy it. I don't actually own any of those. I'm just having another quick look. I don't own any of those because they don't suit my risk reward profile. You say, what's wrong with you? You know, Apelles Pharmaceuticals, those analysts are forecasting 121% to the upside. 
Okay, it's not all of them. Not all these banks agree with each other. Whichever ones are covering this, this is their average price target for those covering these. Doesn't mean I go out and buy, and neither should you. Imagine you see this on a webinar, and you then go out and buy Apelles Pharmaceuticals. Let's say the market drops 20, 30 percent, or that stock drops 40 percent. I'm going to show you how likely that is in a moment with even the big cap stuff. What are you going to say to your spouse? When they say, hey, what's, how's our pension doing? You're going to say, oh, well, we just lost 40% in a month. What are you going to say? Oh, I saw some names offer bloke who looked trustworthy on a webinar. No, that's why you're going to need your own approach. But yes, we'll take that information on board as part of the process, and I'll show you how to handle it. As for, and this is why you're going to need that phone, okay? As for Goldman Sachs, uh, James, no, I don't think it did. Quick answer to yours. Um, Goldman Sachs says, buy these 20 stocks. They have the most upside potential right now, including five set to set, blah, blah, blah. Goldman Sachs names 30 stocks to buy. Well, let me share with you the ones I hold, just because they have them. But I still needed it in my process, and I'll share my process with you, because then it'll give you, I think, more due diligence. Because in our process, mine and what your process is going to become, you're going to look at valuation of a company. Oh, it's profitability, okay? It's uh, growth, sales growth. It's dividends, because we know there is an impact on share price of dividends. There are exceptions to the rule, but we know it has some impact, but it's not the only factor. Similarly, we know valuation has an impact, but it's not the only factor. We know revenue growth ha has impact, but it's not the only factor. Cash flow has impact, but it's not the only factor. You can write these down, value, growth, income, cash flow. We know consistency of returns is a factor, but it's not the only factor. And we also want to outperform the market. That's going to form the base of our strategy. Separate to that, we will have tactics where we might go large cap. We might say, well, it's in our strategy, but tactically, Goldman's happens to pick it or Soros happens to pick it. So tactically, or it's a large cap or a small cap or it's a tech stock. So I'm happy with it. Or it's a Chinese company or it's American. That's tactical. As long as it's my strategy, I don't care what tactics are used. So let me just, you can take these pictures if you want. These are not recommendations for you because just because I hold them doesn't mean I'd buy them today. Probably we won't buy any of them necessarily today, okay? I'm holding them. I hold for 12 months, and I explain why. So why did they make my approved list? Well, valuation, growth, income, cash flow, and I'll show you each of the formulas for this and why they're important. More importantly, you don't care about the formula. Remember when you were doing maths at school and you had to learn the formulas and then you had to practice? Well, you're not at school anymore. You just want the answers. You want to look at the back of the book. There's the answers, and that's more of what we want to do. I don't happen to hold these in the middle list, but they were in my approved list. Why don't I hold them? Well, either because I've either exited them or in the case of Netflix and Disney, or or I can't buy everything. Okay, and these I don't hold, but they're not on my approved list. Even though Goldman's, I've put their targets, 94%, 75%, 50% to the upside, 30%. So what? I don't like those because they're too volatile for me. And volatility is an uh, important factor for me. So I'll explain in detail what are these factors that I look at. Please don't go out and buy these because if the market drops 20%, you've got to explain to your spouse, why did you do it? Blow cough webinar is not going to be something that they're going to be bloody impressed with. So we need to know, well, wait a minute, how do we pick these? Okay, and by the way, in case you want to know, what are hedge funds in? Well, this is Night Owl. They generate 57% per annum over the last three years. So it's the average of, it's 57% per annum average over the last three years. Again, just because I happen to own, and of course it was a good three years for Amazon, Microsoft, and MasterCard, and I happen to own Amazon, Microsoft, MasterCard, Visa, ServiceNow, Alphabet, Fiserv, I did have, don't have now, Facebook have. And you might say, well, that's all very good, but that's backward looking. You're right, let's look to the future then. So which stocks would today make our list? Would some of these still do it? Would they? Well, how do we decide? I'm not going to speculate on, well, no, I think tech will. Well, I heard somebody once say, no, that's not professional enough. We need to have a proper due diligence approach, which is value, growth, income, momentum. Sorry, I meant to say momentum, value, growth, income, momentum. How's it been doing over the recent past? Because that tells us something. Consistency of performance, cash flow, and is it outperforming the market? And I'll come back through all of that in a moment. I'm throwing names at you at the moment and what I own, but that's not enough. Okay, this is uh, Mark Lepekis from uh, Jeffrey. 68% return for ev on average is what he gets for his picks. Now, out of his picks, that's what he happens to get. But does that mean going forward? Well, these are his ratings right now and what upside he thinks. Now, of course, the upside's come down a bit. Now, they might go more than that, but he tends to average about 68%. So what? I don't buy it because of him. What if he drops under a bus? And his NVIDIA really got 27% of the upside after recent falls, or have we spent that? Well, we need to look at it. But this is up to date. That's his historic return. And this is what is the upside price target based on, uh, I think, two days ago. And 
they may well go more than that, all right? But that doesn't mean I'm going to buy them. That's not a stock recommendation for you because what if you're risk averse and you want low volatility stocks? What if you're more risk loving because you're in your 30s and I've got lots of other income sources, then you want higher volatility, maybe even leverage, okay? So we need to look at your risk profile first. That's why you can't just say, oh, I took that as a stock recommendation. It doesn't work like that. And by the way, one of the reasons it doesn't work like that, uh, and the reason I don't want you just picking off journalists or webinars randomly, but having your own process, which I'll teach you, which ticks all those boxes of value, growth, income, cash flow, momentum, is this. Look at those numbers. Again, take a picture if you wish. Just make my picture a bit shorter, but make my fat face smaller. Okay, look at those numbers. What's the probability of a big loss on Apple? 40.4%, it could drop below 20%. That's not to do, it could have a 20% drop. That's not to do with forecasting the market or crystal balls or our analysis of the supply chain of silicon chips and whatever. It's not nothing to do with that. That's just based on the statistical movements of the stock price. Okay, in the recent past. So that's just statistics. So it's not going to be forced through bias of, oh, he really likes Apple. I bet he's got an Apple phone. So he's, he's sort of getting the, that's not a, and it's not a random guess. Oh, I think it's about 40%. Or we've got a load of people around the table say, guys, what do you think? Apple can drop 20%. What probability do you want to put it? And we took an average. No, it's not to do with humans. It's to do with the statistical movement of that price. Similarly with eBay, 44% probability that could drop 20%. Wait a minute. These are supposed to be big, large cap safe companies. If they've got that much, they've got all almost a 50-50 chance of dropping 20%, then, whoa, what about smaller companies? Theirs will be even higher. And these are some of the good ones. And by the way, these are all on my approved list, is it? And, and approved, my approved list is anything which meets my value, growth, income, momentum, cash flow, uh, Sortino, Alpha, uh, and my personal volunteer requirements. And I'll go through that in a second. Okay, so take a picture of this, if you wish. Hey, eBay, Facebook, Oracle. Oracle are surprised relatively low probability of dropping. Costco, now, oh, I should say I don't own Oracle and eBay because I can't buy everything. So I should make that clear. I don't own those two. The others I own and I've got, uh, uh, yeah, eBay, I, sorry, eBay is duplicated. I don't own, own eBay, Oracle, Not nothing against them. I just can't buy everything. Um, okay, and you'll see why, because I have a limited number of stocks in my portfolio. And the reason for that is, uh, and it's something to do with hedge funds in particular. The reason we so often get such good returns is because we're not trying to get 50, 50 great ideas. It's very difficult to get 50 great ideas for stocks. Actually, out of a universe of even 10,000, what we're trying to do is get about 15 great ideas. It's a lot easier. Think about it. 15 is a lot easier than 50, isn't it? obviously. Okay. So we have that. You might think it's concentration. I'm going to show you it's not concentration, actually. Everybody else is over diversified. Whereas a long only fund manager, your retail fund manager, your Vanguard Fidelity guy is just trying to make sure that he doesn't lose you money because he knows you won't complain. And somebody won a Nobel Prize for this. You won't complain from the loss of an opportunity cost of how much you could have made. So they've just got to make sure you don't lose money. And how do they do that? They just track an index, basically, by having 50 to 100 stocks in a fund, keep charging you fees, five, and they say to you, oh, you've got to hold on for five years, you know? And five years later, you think, oh, bugger, what am I going to do now? Five years of my life have gone in any event, and he hasn't lost me any money at least. Fine, okay, that's their trick. I think it's a con what fund managers do, uh, but they get away with it. Okay. Which are the crisis protection stocks then? Is it tech? Is it large cap? Is it small cap? All right. These ones happen to be on my uh, approved list at the moment, but, but, but look at the probabilities. You've still got, now, a lot of my students, Ravi, you made over 100% on Crocs, but this is why I put on my Telegram channel. Listen, guys, don't get too greedy. Okay. That's why how do we protect those gains? So let's say you made 100% and you've got a stock which has got a 60% probability of dropping 20%. How do you protect yourself? And a 56% probability of dropping 30%. What, you're going to, oh, no, I'll just hold it forever. Well, no. Crocs is a great example. They make those ugly shoes. That stocks have fashions. Can't hold it forever. It's going to be out of fashion in Oh, God knows, might already have happened. All right. Uh, this is Home Depot or Home, Home Depot. All right. That's Marsh McLaren, the world's largest insurance company. That's also an insurance. 
uh, and you can see the probabilities. We're not going to buy it off probabilities alone. But you've asked me, some of you have asked me, how do I protect my gains that I've had? It's the biggest question at the moment on the market's mind. How do you protect some of the gains? Well, we're going to look at, you know, if that's more suited to you, then these statistics, I think, are important. That's why I look at these. But that's just one part of it. That's just one part. And by the way, if you're really worried about a bear market, and I hope you're taking a photo of these. I can't write this stuff down, all right? You know, you can't be doing pen and paper. You better all have a camera phone because otherwise, right? So... This is the guy, Michael Burry, again, just to give you, a, as I promised you I would, uh, an insight into hedge funds. Um, this is Michael Burry of The Big Short. You know the movie The Big Short? Fantastic film. How well made. Talk about financial education at its best. The Big Short, that's his fund. He's the one who called the financial crisis. Doesn't mean he'll call it again. Uh, I, the reason I've circled in yellow Tesla is just it's a put, which means he expects it to fall. The others, he's got call options on. Interestingly enough, now, again, just because he's got them doesn't mean I'm going to buy them. The guy's managing billions, by the way. Uh, that's his address and phone number if you want it. I mean, don't harass him. Um, so what's my job? What are the numbers? So, Ravi, you're on here again. Um, Ravi, you love listening to my webinars. I love that. Um, I give prizes, actually, to my students who follow me and get 100% return within 12 months on individual stocks. We give, we give medals. Uh, so the, he picked Crocs. Uh, I'll come to um, oil because that was uh, a, what we call a special situation. Etsy, Medifast uh, as well. So that's not bad. Four out of whatever, 15 picks got 100% return. Um, just to say on that, my job is to try and pick things like crops. Now, if I could always just pick that or like Etsy or like Medifast, guess what? I would have just put all my money in one. But even I won't take that kind of risk of only having one stock. That's why me, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates diversify into more than one stock, right? And so should you. I look to hold over 12 months. I'll show you in the next chart from Goldman Sachs why. I'm looking to have 15 stocks. I'll show you in another chart why that's ample diversification. You might want to have 20. 25% is the stop loss. In other words, if it drops 25% from the highest it's been, put another way, it's a trailing stop loss, then I'd exit, okay? Now, I'll show you in a second how, depending on your risk appetite, you might change those rules. You might say, no, I'll exit half of it at 15% drop, the other half at 25%. And there are some stocks, if they drop 25%, I'll buy more, okay? Not many, there's only five of those, and I'll tell you those in a second as well. And 40 is the return I'm looking for, that's my business. Let's say I only hit 20, and I'll show you the business plan or the return for my pension and SIP, which I think is a good return target you should set for yours if we only get 20%. Why? Well, I'm targeting 40, but if I only get 20, that's what I want to build. Like any good business person, I want to build my future not on the upside and the cream, but on worst-case scenario, okay? Because then the upside, I'm happy. I'm a happy person because everything else is then cream. Why 12 months? Well, this is from Goldman's. I'm not going to go into the details of this. You can take a picture if you wish. But the holding period over which we really think people are looking at financials has diminished over time. That's why when people used to say, oh, just buy and hold forever, find stocks you can buy and hold forever. Th those people, you know, they're probably still stuck in the time warp in the 60s or 70s. We don't do that anymore. Uh, the world changes too quickly. 12 months is an adequate time frame okay um by the way and ravi you've been great great at this um investing in one sense is the most useless profession in the world because you're actually piggybacking on the hard labors of other people because you're a shareholder you're a filthy dirty capitalist okay that's what capitalists are and that's why you know we're disliked because just for providing capital we get rental income off them basically um it's the hardest easy money you'll make or it's the easiest hard money you'll ever make please find fulfillment elsewhere um a, a little bit of a plug, not virtue signaling, but a little bit of a plug. I'm co-chairman of the Lumbar Foundation, which looks after widows and orphans. I get a ton of fulfillment out of this because I can do this uh, with the Lumbar Foundation and one or two other causes I'm associated with, uh, but rather than just investing. Because once you've you know looked after your family, and I'm a teetotal vegetarian, so how much how much looking after does my family need? And as my son said to me this morning, my three-year-old son, um, when I said to him, "I've got to go to work to make money for you," Rian, he said, "Daddy." don't need money, come stem, do the jigsaw. So I did. <laughs> uh, so the point is, please find fulfillment elsewhere beyond investing. Let's just get your investing. Let's go back to investing, get your investing sorted, okay? Valuation, right? What are the factors that move share prices? Now, we know from academic research and from banks that obviously valuation, you know that from your own readings. But which part of valuation of a company? What is valuation? Well, it's the profitability related to the share price, or is it growth of profits related to share price, or is it book value, you know, the value of all the assets 
related to the share price, or is it sales in a company related to share price, or is it discount cash flow? All its cash flows brought forward. Could be a variety of things, couldn't it? So what we did is we looked at the literature and we found that actually, if you pick one of these, you're pretty much close enough to picking the others. Remember, we're not looking at a perfect crystal ball. If we had that, and you could do that with the market and forecast when a president's going to do a tweet or whatever, then you'd only pick one stock anyway. That's why we're still diverse. So we only need to be approximately right to get our returns. We're not trying to pick the best portfolio in the world or the top 15 stocks in the world. We're just trying to pick a team which will give us the return we want. There might be other teams who also do well. That's good luck to them. Okay. Now, growth. Revenue growth is what I'm looking for. What about earnings growth? Yes, we'll look at that. Cash flow. I'll come to that in a second. We'll look at that. We know this is a factor. Dividend yields are a factor. And you can't have dividends without profits because you're not allowed by law to give dividends uh, out of uh, anything other than profits. So unprofitable companies can't pay dividends for a start. And we know there are companies which are unprofitable with, with overvaluation and diminishing growth whose share price still goes up. Yes, that's called speculation and gambling. And we don't want to do that. By ticking each of these, given that it's for my child's inheritance and my pension, I need to tick each of these boxes. If I don't tick these boxes, then I'm speculating. Speculation is where you make a decision on incomplete information and have to rely on luck. We don't want to do that. I certainly don't want to do that. 99% of private investors, in my experience, are speculators without realizing it, right? Unless you're looking at journalists are speculators without realizing it. I'm gonna give you a free copy of this book, which is an international bestseller, and it's about investing, and it's about also my time at Bloomberg and how journalism and my time uh, co-hosting on CNBC, how journalism isn't the 360 picture. It's not meant to be. Journalism or financial you know, TVs are meant to be uh, uh, entertaining and a bit of information, okay? Momentum. Adult, but which part of this is important? Is it important? Well, surely companies, and there is uh, evidence from uh, Citibank, for instance, and others in academia, that momentum does tend to carry. But it's not the only thing, because it can be outweighed, for instance, by a company not growing or overvalued. And statistical movements, I showed you. Wouldn't that be useful to know, as I just showed you, which companies? I mean, I didn't know Oracle's less likely to fall 20%, as is Microsoft, than, say, a PayPal. I mean, I had a gut instinct, but I didn't know, okay, isn't that important? And if I was to rough and ready guess it, then I'd say out of every $100 return I get, and this is very rough and ready, don't hold me to this, okay, this is a guesstimate, that's about $24 comes out of the valuation of the company, $23 of those stock market gains are due to growth, the dividend yield is one thing, but the fact that there is a dividend deal will generate some stock price movement, cash flow will, um, and then statistical movements, volatility, outperformance of the market, consistency of performance. These are all factors. Now, if you don't look at some of these and you still get a $100 return, you speculated and you got lucky. If you look at all of these and you got a $100 return, you didn't speculate, you didn't get lucky, you just did your due diligence. So we want to make sure we don't get bad companies. That's how we do it. Uh, as well, Hern Bay. Hi, I mean, thank you. Another T-Turtle vegetarian. Shout out for those. We just love telling people, don't we? Uh, so due diligence is this, 10,000 stocks so that we don't make the mistakes of fund managers. What's the mistake that fund managers make? Well, they've got a UK growth fund or a Japanese income fund or a European uh, uh, value fund. Guess what? They've got a small gene pool of CVs in front of them in which they're putting your capital. Right? We're not going to make that mistake. For your pension, you'll sit ISA, I suggest look at the universe of 10,000 stocks. We then look at which ones tick our boxes on valuation, on revenue growth, so year on year revenue growth. Valuation can be as simple as earnings uh, relative to PE, earnings relative to share price, dividend deals. What about cash flow? And I'll show you the cash flow formula in a second as well. They tick our box. And as you ask each of these companies to tick more boxes, guess what? Your CVs that you're left with decreases. I personally at the moment tactically want more companies with lower volatility because guess what? The bloody market looks like it's going to go up, go down, go up. I don't want that kind of uh, volatility at the moment, personally. It doesn't mean you should copy me, but um, I want slightly lower volatility. I want ones which are outperforming the market. Otherwise, I'll have an index tracker. Uh, and I want ones which are consistently doing it, something called the Sortino ratio, okay, which is very popular amongst hedge fund managers and sovereign wealth funds when they're looking to invest in us. Uh, but then it's, it's unknown to retail fund managers, the people your pension's with. 
Okay, because uh, they're just not educated to a high degree, I'm afraid, pension long only retail fund managers. And you'll end up with about one to two percent of stocks, which are which are suitable. And it should be that hard. You only need 15 to 20 in your portfolio. So why would you not keep making the process tighter and tighter and harder and harder to get in? Imagine you are, uh, I don't know, Oxford University, and there's only 15 places on your program, and you have 10,000 applicants. Would you not make it more and more difficult until you've only got 15 who are ideally suited or as good as you want? So where did we get this data from for valuation, growth, income? Is this just me picking it out of the air? Or is there actually research behind it? Well, one source of research isn't the only one. I'll show you others. Uh, is this what's worked in investing studies, investment approaches, and characters associated with exceptional returns? Yeah, you think this is the first time somebody's thought about this? You think in a in an industry which is worth trillions, they don't pay academics to work this stuff out? You better believe they do. And what kind of research do they come back with? What kind of answers? Well, for instance, they worked out, and this will not be news to you, uh, companies with the lowest PE, price to earnings, or best valuations tend to generate about 14%, depends on uh, when and inflation rates and which period, et cetera, et cetera. That's not my point. The point is this. I know we're going to get some return from valuation. I know we're going to get some return from high growth. I know we're going to get some return from dividends. And you might say, well, that means you're going to miss out Tesla, Alpesh, and Bitcoin and NFTs. So be it. I'll put that money in a separate pot called gambling. Okay, and that's fine. That's fine. We can talk about that separately. All right. Uh, the other three people that I've used, and they're mentioned in my books before those three people, uh, Eugene Famer, Richard Thaler, and Daniel Kahneman got the Nobel Prize in economics, each one of them, and those are the years in which they got them. I was following their research and publishing it in my FT columns, I'm pleased to say. Uh, obviously, I wasn't the only one to recognize how amazing they were. There, were, there was the entire industry and uh, economists from around the world, I, they did. But I, I would say that my approach is based on a large part to their findings. And I've published them, like I said, in my books. And I'll give you a free download of this book so you can look it all up as well. But it's in my other books, in my FT columns. Okay, so that's where the source of information is. And in my books, those are the, those are the don't go out and buy them. Okay, I get next to nothing in royalties, right? And they're also the people who are, I'd say, a large part behind my uh, private equity fund in terms of thinking to the extent you can, it's relevant to private equity, and also the hedge fund side of stuff. So just going back to that point again, 1999, there's the article in 1999. Uh, I don't know if you can read that. Yes, and what's more, they should probably sell up their entire UK holdings and buy only US stocks. I've been shifting virtually all my long-term holdings from UK to US. It's been a good 22 years for me, obviously. OK, uh, you only need to look at the broader market. So how do you do that? How do you also look at that broader uh, market? And, and by the way, this is not just, oh, yeah, you had a really good time once in 1999. No, this has been going on and on and on. OK, um, so let's look at those other issues that I said in terms of let's take information from academia and the banks. And, and how do we protect the gains? How do we find those gains? Which other stocks are there? So let's take a deeper dive into value, growth, income, momentum, cash flow, uh, consistency of our performance of the market, right? Before we do that, we want to look at what we're trying to achieve. How much money are we trying to make? Okay, this is about, this has got to be about making money, right? Because that's what pensions are there for. They're making money, all right? Uh, uh, otherwise, what the hell are they there for, right? And SIPs and ISAs, and if you're in your 30s, like Ravi is, actually, feel free to put, I won't share it with people. Well, nobody will know who you are. It's still be anonymous. Put, please put your date, uh, your um, ages down. Um, that would be interesting. I'm going to start a poll as well on the FTSE and see where people think it's going to go. Assume you've got, you plan to invest over the next 10 years, which, I mean, for the rest of your life, you should be investing. But let's just say over the next 10 years, let's pick a 10-year target. And with my help, let's say you make 20% per annum. Some of that's going to, you know, some years you'll make more, some years you make less. Don't forget, you'll get a tailwind from the markets anyway. So nothing extravagant, nothing pessimistic. It's not guaranteed. It's not a bank account with paying 20% interest. It's the market. So nothing's guaranteed. Let's say you've got 10K in your SIP or ISA. It's just 10K, that's all, um, which is similar to my son. He's three years old. Guess what? We max out his ISA each year. Uh, so we had 10K put in in April. Wow, nine nine thousand eight hundred. I think it was. Uh, you also plan to add five hundred each month to your portfolio. All right. Uh, so if you're an adult, you know you've got twenty k is your max. You, let's say you put that in. All right. Uh, <laughs> um, Thirty year old Amir from Sydney. Good. Oh, so we've got people good age. Uh, Sixty three year old. Uh, you'll you'll have over six hundred k in fifteen years. That's what you have on that maths. Okay, and this is what it looks like. Now, the reason I always show this, and I tend to look at this regularly, because it's important. So my son's about here, 
all right? He's just slightly above the contributions he's put in. You know when people say, oh, compound interest, everyone, it's the seventh wonder of the world, blah, 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 blah. You know what the problem with that is? It only really starts paying off later on at the back end. At the back end, it pays off. In the early years, the re why do people still not save and invest, assuming they've got money to save and invest in the early years? Why are they so irrational and they don't bother doing Because for the first few years, it just looks like you've barely beaten your contributions you're putting in. That's why. It's only at this end when you're older, and who the hell wants to miss out on their younger years when they could, I don't know, buy more clothes uh, just so they get a payback later on? That's why with my son, by the time he goes to university in another 12, whatever, 15 years, he should have about half a million. That's my job. You might say, what, only half a million? Surely Alpeshi should have more. No, the little bugger from his ISA I'm talking about. Now, let's put it another way. Let's say instead you've got a bit more capital. Uh, 47, 40. Um, uh, and now, Anise, you said something really important. Anissa said, I'm 47. I'm late to start investing. You're not. You're actually not. And I'll show you why in a second. Uh, and a lot of people feel this. And the data and research shows a lot of men, and particularly women, are later, i.e. they're starting in their 40s. Um, yes, of course, I'd love it if you were a geek like me and you bought your first stock at the age of 12, but you'd end up looking like me and, ew, you know, you don't want that. Um, but you're not, because actually, I was going to show you the maths. Actually, 47, 57, 67. Obviously, it's not as good as starting in your 20s, but I wouldn't regret it. I'd say 47 better, better now than having left it longer. A bit like my workouts. Assume you plan to invest over 10 years. So that'll just take you up to 57. You won't even have retired, okay? And let's say you make 20%. Even though we're targeting 40, let's say 20. Let's say you've saved 100 thanks to your employer's pension contributions, your pension contributions, your savings, whatever, okay? And 100, you know, it's modest, but it's all right, right? And you plan to add one and a half K each month to that because you can save and you've got enough and you've got a bit left over. Let's just make these assumptions for now. Well, you'll have a million in 10 years. How does that sound? You start with 100K today and have a million in 10 years on just 20%? That That's all right. I mean, it's not guaranteed 20% returns. That's why we've got to do that due diligence on the stocks and make sure they're bloody good. Value, growth, income. Obviously, the last 12 months were fantastic. The last 36 months, the last 48 months, the last 64 months, you know, it's been a good few years. 2008 wasn't a good year. 2001 wasn't a good year. Okay. Um, so that's what it'll look like. Okay. So let's say you're 47. You start there. Let's say you've got 100K. You'd end up over there, closer to over there. Okay. Uh, just sharing the results of that FTSE poll with you. 66% of you think it'd be higher than it is today. Fair enough. I mean, I try and buy the kind of stocks that if the market goes up, they go up. If the market falls, they don't fall as far. Okay. I'd love stocks only to go up, but they're not bank accounts, right? Here's a question with the doubt. And that's our goal. We want to turn 100 into a million over 10 years. Let me put it another way. Let's say you've got 100K in your um, savings. Let's say with my help, you just improved by 10%. Forget this 20% nonsense. Let's say you just get a 10% improvement over what fund manager is delivering you from the education you're getting on this webinar. If you get a 10% improvement on 100K, that's 10K this year, and then that compounds next year. That'll be 11K next year because you'll have 110 if all you got was a 10% return and improvement. Okay? So that's why even small returns, that's why it's not too late because – even small changes, 10%, makes a massive difference on the capital, all right? Um, why do I say 15 stocks? So remember those numbers, 12, 15, uh, 25, 40. Why? Well, this is common. There's a lot of uh, data on this. You know, there's this mis- notion, uh, James, David, you know, in your 40s, very similar, um, uh, sort of in the same place. Dan, Matthew, great time to start in your 20s, phenomenal time to start, because if I show you the maths on it, life becomes a hell of a lot easier by the time you're in your 40s, but can't have regrets of that. You know, I wish I'd had fewer hamburgers when I was in my 20s, but there you go, veggie hamburgers, Linda McCartney stuff. Right, here we go, 10 to 15 to 20 uh, why? Because of this. Now, people say to me, no, all fund managers have 50 to 100 stocks. Yes, they index track because effectively they've eliminated stock specific risk. So all they've got is market risk. So what are they left with? The market. Too many stocks. And if you want evidence, and this isn't the only article in the Financial Times, there's a whole load more. OK, I've even started a campaign uh, on this issue. Incidentally, another person doing that campaign is Gina Miller, independent of me. Uh, underperformance are rife among active fund managers because imagine this. Unlike you, an active fund manager has a trillion dollars under management or a hundred billion or a billion or whatever. So they are told by their boss, right, divide that up into a UK fund, US fund, European fund, 
right? Do a growth fund, value fund, income fund, right? So that all of a sudden they've got nine funds right there. So they can divide the money into each. But the problem with that is each one is picking from an arrow gene pool and they're picking their own little index. So guess what? And I'll show you, I'll x-ray one in a second. On top of that, if you're in the UK, like so many of you are, and you're only looking at UK stocks, as most UK fund managers invest in just UK stocks, that's your performance over the last five years. Actually, the FTSE, you're in negative territory, okay? And the NASDAQ and the S&P, you know, you got, so your American cousin, so imagine you've got a cousin in America over the last five years, he's there or she's there saying to you, hey, my pension doubled. How about y'all? And you're there going, oh, uh, mine's down 12%. You're the poor cousin. And that's got nothing to do with stock picks. That's just the index tracking. Oh, you might say, oh, well, no, nobody picked NASDAQ five years ago. Are you kidding me? Okay, forget that. S&P 500, 500 stocks, large companies. Okay, just index tracking. Well, your American cousin's still up, what, 63% over you, 65% over you in just five years. Five years, right? Most people don't realize SIPs and ISIS can include American. So I'm not, the, the, the message is not buy American. The message is value, growth, income. We're going to pick from a big gene pool. That's a typical fund. Okay, and they'll do things like this. They'll have eight out of 10 scores. They'll have five diamonds. They'll have a letter A, A, diamonds, and 10. All right, it's always that bullshit. It's always diamonds out of five, score out of 10, or alphabet letters, okay? Um, uh, it's That's the problem you've got, right? A, diamonds, and A, right? Three years, down 2.3%. Fantastic, great, okay? How useless is that then, right? Over three years, one of the biggest bull markets in history, and they're down 3%. Now, and we're not talking about leverage. We're not talking about derivatives. This is before we do any of that. Imagine on top of that, if you're using uh, uh, leverage, and I'm going to show you on my riskier side why I only use two times leverage, then you're doing even better. Okay, And what did this genius fund manager who called it equity growth. You can see it's only UK and equity growth. What did they buy? Well, their definition of equity growth was British American bloody tobacco, because obviously everybody's smoking more, aren't they? That's where the growth is in the future, son. Buy tobacco stocks. <sighs> yeah, no wonder they were down 2.3%. They were in oil before the oil crash and all went to zero. Anyway, 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 the point is this, 40 stocks, this is why your fund manager is underperforming. And I've got a big mouth. I think you can be better than an overpaid fund manager. So the FT asked me to prove it and do it. So I did in 2004. I said to them when they approached me for the first time to do that, and I did. And that's the year I launched my uh, hedge fund as well. Uh, because Neil Woodford came 14th. There he is. Okay, and I keep mentioning this. Anyway, 13 years later or whatever, he had um, 9.2 billion under management. Can you believe it? Yeah, so if you don't think that long only retail fund managers like him are, you know, that there's not a big scam going on, uh, pfft, he's just one who got caught out. They're not very good. They can barely beat random number generators like a cat. Okay, the editor put the cat in to just try and embarrass people. And the ones that ended up embarrassing were their regular columnists and stock pickers, I'm afraid. So most people don't have a clue. They don't have a clue. And it gets worse. This is from that fund document, and yours will be the same. And you're going to turn around and say, no, because my fund only charges 1% fees. Have a look. There's been articles in the press, and I've written articles about this on my LinkedIn, that actually it's a lot more. £10,000 investment over five years, they're taking £1,000 off you. And of course, they are asking for a recommended holding period of five years. Of course they are, because they've got private school fees to pay for their children. So they want you to be locked in for five years. They also know statistically you're not likely to have lost money. Well, it's not a bloody bank account. You know, where they say, well, you won't have lost money. That's not the job of the fund manager. It's to actually get a bloody return, right? So they won't have lost your money over five years. The stock market over five years on a rolling period tends not to, even the UK one. And they charge you a thousand pounds for keeping your account. Even your bank doesn't charge you that much over five years. All right. So you're paying 10% of your capital, 10,000 pounds. Uh, and that's one I picked from one of my students. That vitality fund is not one I picked because I thought, oh, it was really bad. It's just one of one of my students he had, and we showed him, and I said, well, you're paying a 1000 So you've got 100 k uh, unless they've capped their costs, which they tend not to, it's a percentage, you'll have paid 10 grand in five years. 10 grand in five years, right there. Okay, let alone not have performed. 
I'm going to show you some data at the end of this, um, some technology that my headphones uh, spun out, but I'll show you right at the end. Okay, you don't have to stay for that bit because I'm going to talk a bit about my plans uh, for the future because we want to we want to disrupt this uh, fund management industry using what we know from the technology side of things and the financial technology side of things to disrupt the long only fund managers so people like you uh, have more control. But I'll show that at the, you don't have to stay for those 10 minutes, but I'm just saying now, uh, because I don't want people to say, oh, you talked about yourself at the end and you ruined what otherwise was really good. Uh, by the way, are you enjoying this? Is it okay? Because uh, I want to take you through, once we've got our strategy, which is value, let me know if you're enjoying it, because if you're not enjoying it, I'll just stop now. All right. <laughs> Um, uh, so let me know if you're enjoying it as well and you want me to keep going, right? Once you've got the strategy, value, growth, income, cash flow, return, consistency, volatility, so I want volatility to be low, outperformance of the market, I should have put in momentum there as well. Then around that, I might reduce the number of stocks I have based on tactics, and those are the six particular tactics I look at, but I'll show you some of those now. And I promised you also, just to keep you all sweet, my friends, I promised you I would give you some freebies just for being on here. You can go there, you can freely download those three books, actually some more as well, including my own one, and you'll see my time at Bloomberg, but you'll also see uh, some of the stuff that I'm teaching you in this as well. And you'll um, uh, get to uh, read about that. And uh, it was really good. Okay, so you can go there and do it. And you can download those books, Intelligent Investor and Investment Philosophies, Successful Strategies and Investors. But most people don't want to read this. They say, no, Alpish, I want to talk to you one-to-one -one, and I want to get the answers. Uh, and I want to learn that way. And that's fine, okay? That's fine. All right, so let's look at investing tactic number one within the strategy. Now, remember, just because Goldman Sachs or Warren Buffett own something doesn't mean I'm going to buy it. That's that's got it's got to be within my strategy then if they've got it fine so be it so let's look at some of the guru buys we might look at oh there you go okay now your definition my definition of guru might differ i don't care doesn't matter but here are some of the top 10 holdings and look at how few stocks they have so atman hedge fund manager seven stocks 10 billion i told you hedge funds tend to be rather concentrated they try to have a few good ideas rather than lots and lots of good ideas because getting lots of good ideas is very difficult. Um, Bill Gates, 15 stocks in his portfolio. That's not his net worth. That's his stock portfolio. Okay, 23 billion. He's got other investments in retail. He owns Four Seasons. It's a private uh, hotel chain. Okay, uh, so that's not included in this because it's private. Carl Icahn, 17 stocks, 24 billion. All right, and so on. Soros, 5 billion in this portfolio. He might have others. Uh, he's got more because they're an active uh, fund. Uh, Warren Buffett, 44 stocks, 20, 293 billion, okay, uh, for half of which pretty much is in Apple. But so what? Alphabet, so what? Doesn't mean I'm going to buy it just because they've got it. What if, and feel free to take a picture, I can't go through all of this, but take a picture. What if we could aggregate that, not just amongst these big billionaires, but a lot more gurus and billionaires? What if we could? What if we could? Okay, this, this could be it. S&P 500, a number of gurus. Uh, and their ownership. So darker the green, the more uh, the gurus own that particular stock. That darkest green one happens to be Amazon. 18 months ago, it was United Healthcare, which has now slipped down to there. Now, that could be because people are protecting themselves or otherwise. Now, just because I happen to own Amazon, Facebook, myself, two times leverage, and I'll tell you why only two times in a second and not 10 times or 100 times, uh, doesn't mean it's because of these gurus. It's because it met my criteria. Now, you'd expect my criteria to be similar to some of their criteria. Otherwise, I'd get the Nobel Prize in economics and not some of the people we've been following because I'm only standing on their shoulders. We haven't invented anything new other than we want to tick all the boxes, value, growth, income, cash flow, momentum, Sortina, Alpha, and so on. The more important thing I want to show you, this is leverage on big, leverage big on low risk. Now, Leverage is risky. I'm not going to give you more risk warnings than that, but th that is a risk warning I'm giving you. All right. Now, I'm still going to continue because um, what I do is I pick stocks which have got relatively lower risk. I, they've got profiles like this over a 250 day period. OK, so their returns are positive and there's a narrow enough distribution that I'm not likely to lose money. And then I do two times leverage. Why only two times leverage, whether it's an exchange traded product? or a CFD or a spread bet over 12 months? Well, because of this, because in 20 days, I could be down 34%. I don't like being down 34%. Yeah, but I'll push it, it's only 34% now. If you hold on through it, no, the nature of leverage is that it actually works against you as well. So be careful. Costco is that one. I happen to have two times leverage. These returns are outdated here, but I just wanted to show these. Um, 
Oh, the S&P, I've actually got three times, but that's my business. Um, I don't normally do three times, and that was opened uh, a while back. That's now over 100% um, from when that was recorded. Uh, two times on Amazon, two times on Microsoft. I also have two times on Costco uh, as well. I, I'm, that's not a recommendation. Leverage is risky. I can't say any more, but it's just so I'm covering that. Investment tactic, it should say tactic, not strategy, sorry. What banks are saying they're richest clients? Let's look at the analysts first. So it just so happens that if it's on my approved list of by value, growth, income, cash flow, momentum, Sortino, and an analyst has said, hey, look, this is our analyst price target, which in this case was 78 when the price was at 42 last year. And if you watch me in April 2020 on this webinar, you'll know. Okay, well, that was a 66% return. Not because of that analyst. Now, let me be absolutely clear. Not because of the analyst. Because that would be looking at one piece of information, that would be speculation, that would be gambling. No, but because we had all the other boxes ticked on value, growth, income, cash flow, so that reduced and mitigated our risk. If we only looked at analysts, we wouldn't have made 66%. We would have made it on that one and lost it on the 50 others. So it wouldn't have benefited us. If we just looked at journalists who happened to get something right once, we wouldn't have won. Okay, similarly, this was Capri Holdings from April 7th. 12-month 12 holdings is what I'm looking at, remember. That was a 250% return. They don't all go up like this, um, but we're just saying, it, just because the analysts had that target, uh, doesn't mean that's what we got the return. We got it because tactically that fit, but strategically it fit, and strategy is more important than tactics. I already mentioned Disney. That was March 30th, it was at $99. The, up, the target, average target from the analyst was 144 uh, We had to get out 173 That was 73%. Why? Because if anything drops, um, either 12 months are up or it's dropped 25% from the peak it's been. Oh, but Abisha did so well. Why would you exit it if 12 months are up? Well, because then we've got to relook at everything and think for the next 12 months. Just because we had one good year doesn't mean in, in this stock, doesn't mean we're going to hold it forever. Just because they were nice to us for 12 months doesn't mean we're married to it. We've got to relook at us 10,000 CVs. We're going to rehire for our portfolio again, obviously. Okay, similar with Uber. Now, this is an interesting one because last March when we were, everything was being locked down, nobody would have said Uber. There was, what the hell? But our numbers, you know, we go by the data. We're like those boring scientists on the prime minister's sort of um, uh, briefings. We went by the numbers and the numbers said, this is what could happen. And indeed it did. Okay, similarly with Viacom. If I knew Viacom was going to go up 200%, now this is a really important point, then I would have put all my money in that, wouldn't I? I would have leveraged it a billion fold probably. would have borrowed money and put it into that, but I didn't know. We knew we had a certain target. We didn't know it was going to happen, okay, at all necessarily. We think there's a higher probability, but not a certainty. We don't have a crystal ball. That's why we still, like a Warren Buffett or a or a Bill Gates, we still have more than one stock. Otherwise, it would have all got in Viacom. Okay, and it just so happened it did well, but they don't all work out like that. Or United Healthcare, which was only 41%, that was just our target. Okay, do you understand? And when I say analysts, you've got to look at the analyst name, how, how many other people agree with them, what their target is, how big it is, how many people agree with the target, how big that analyst is, how consistent, how big a firm they work with, and how recently they gave that data. All of that information is important, not just, so this is Visa from last year, not just one piece of information. Guess what happens after all of that? Visa might only give you a 10% return. And you think, oh, what? After I'm near my 40. No, because some stocks you're holding for more solidity, okay? Investment tactic, uh, for sort of the second part of four, what the big banks tell their clients, not the analysts this time, but what the wealth managers at the big banks. So this is Goldman Sachs. These are their own slides. Okay, these are their own slides that I stole about 10 odd years ago. And what they discovered, and this is why we look at cash flow. So that's cash flow. It's a measure of cash flow. Not the only one, but I think it's the better one. Cash return on capital invested. And that's what the formula means. You don't need to remember the formula. You're not a school child anymore. You just want the answers. And what they discovered through their quantum database and Goldman Sachs research, so this is Goldman Sachs Wealth Management. It was Jim O'Neill. I was just sitting next to him at lunch. They had about 15 of us, and they were telling us what their teams do because they wanted my hedge fund to allocate capital to them. So they have to show what they do. And I thought, bloody hell, I'm stealing this. Actually, they stole this from Deutsche Bank, this uh, formula. Um, the top quartile, the top 25% of stocks by Crokey get 30% CAGR. Now, I'm not just going to look at that alone, okay? They get 30%, uh, sorry, 30% per annum, 
Like, in some years, like 2008, they don't get that. In other years, um, they get more. That's not the point. Okay, can you see? Some years you do better, some years you do well. It's not guaranteed. It's not a bank account. But just because they've got that, I'll give you an example. Okay, um, let me just show you something, right? So just because I'm going to look at that, that's not going to be enough, right? Because I know there's value growth income, uh, which might be too low. So if it doesn't green light me, yes, I know the higher the croquis, that's an average there of 21% in six months. This is, um, uh, sorry, that is six month performance. That's the cash flow in the top quartile. That's a return of 36% in uh, six months. Or if I highlight all of those that you can see on screen, that's 45% return in six months. Not bad. Croaky correlation, yeah, but that's not the only thing I'm going to look at, I'm afraid, uh, because some of those stocks will still be too high risk for me because they don't meet my value growth. You might say you're being too fussy. Why don't you just look at this formula and nothing else? I'm sorry, no, because it won't be necessarily suitable for my volatility test. So I really narrow it down, value, growth, income, cash flow, and I suggest you do that as well. If you want to do proper due diligence, you want to be educated properly on it, then do all of that. Tactic six, well, as long as it's the strategy, value, growth, income, cash flow, momentum, is this. What's, what are the hedge funds? I showed you already. The hedge funds out of this list, by the way, uh, are Bill Ackman, um, uh, Leon Cooperman, and George Soros, George Soros, and those are the holdings. And I showed you one or two of the other hedge funds. I do happen to own Globant. This is their most recent hedge fund activity from when we bought it. So we were looking at it, and we bought it uh, when we had this in front of us and we still own it. Cadence, we still own a billion dollar company and that's it. That, so, you know, we will look at hedge fund that, but that's a minor tactical decision. To be honest, if we didn't look at any tactic and we just stuck to the strategy and tactics were random, that'd be fine. That's the point, okay? Um, those are my sort of rules, right? Your rules might be different. You don't need that one, right? And then we put it into this. So, and that's what I suggest you do. Value, growth, income. So valuation can be PE ratio, revenue growth, dividend yields, cash flow, uh, Sortino, which is consistency of performance, outperformance of the market, and momentum, the most recent performance, right? That way, and you're going to hold for 12 months. Remember those numbers, 12 months, 15 to 20 stocks. If it drops 25% from the peak, you'd stop. Now you're going to tweak that according to your risk levels. If you're risk averse, you might say, no, I'm going to have 25. I'm going to have more stocks. Uh, if you're risk averse, you're going to go from lower volatility companies, okay, and so on. Put another way, if you're more risk averse, always think of it as a line. Always think of it uh, risk as a line. If you're more risk averse, you might say, well, I'll have 15% trailing stock for uh, from the high since I purchased it. If you're risk neutral, you might say, well, I'll exit half of it at 15%, the rest at 25% drop from the peak it's been. So it's gone up 100% and it drops 85%. You sell half the position. If it then drops to just a 75% gain for, sorry, 75% gain for you, you might get rid of the other half, okay? Uh, uh, and that's how you should, you know, so when you try and work out where do you sit, that's why I can't advise you. It's not my job to advise you. It's to educate you so you can make the decisions.